You're very welcome to today's talk. It's Thursday the 18th of February. Now I'm going to consider the way that cases are falling in the United States, the UK and, and indeed in the world at the moment. Uh, try and explain that a little bit more. But I'm going to start off with the COVID human challenge studies. Now these are starting in England, in the United Kingdom, in the next week or two, in the next two, two or three weeks we believe they're starting. So this is where people will de be deliberately inoculated with virus to see how they respond to the virus and to test the efficacy of new second generation vaccines. Now I use the term inoculation there advisedly, they are being inoculated with the virus. Now inoculation means to give live organisms. So when people say that 16 million people have been inoculated against SARS coronavirus 2 in the United, United Kingdom, that's wrong. They haven't been given live virus. We, we, we know about these vaccines. They have been vaccinated. So inoculation means to give the live version, and that's what's being done. So we're going to look at that first. And of course, this has been done nowhere else in the world. The United Kingdom is first. It's never been done anywhere else. Believe that if you want. But this is the first time it's been done officially. So um, human challenge studies, quite a few references on this. Um, specially convened research ethics committee. Now, people always talk about the ethics of this. And to be fair, the news reports I've seen, I've, I've kind of brushed over on this. They'll say, yes, we're doing these human challenge studies. Oh, an ethical approval has been given and they just pass over. You know, as if it's been given by someone who works at the corner shop or something. You know, it's important to know where these things, where these things come from. So, I did do a bit of digging on that, and it's a special, um, special committee conve convened by the, the Health Research Authority. It's part of the NHS actually, but it wasn't part of the uh, the Medicines and Healthcare Regulatory Authority's remit. So, um, it's been authorised by the the Healthcare Research Authority. And it's under the auspices of Imperial College London, and this chap here is the chief investigator. So um, check all that out. There's plenty of links for that if you wanted to take that further. Um, basically, what it means that this has been approved by the, the British government for, uh, for clinical research, because the NHS is like an official body and they've delegated it to the HRA and they've appointed this special committee. So that, that's, that's the way it's been done. Actually, interestingly, I don't know who's on the committee. I didn't find that. I don't think I think it's probably publicly available, but I didn't find it. So 90 people are being recruited between the ages of 18 and 30, of course, who are very unlikely to become ill. And I think we can take it. They'll have no comorbidities. These are people that have um, the minimal risk if exposed to the virus. Now, on the news reports, people are always saying, well, is this safe? Well, of course, it's not safe. It's a stupid question. Giving live virus to human beings is not safe. Is it as safe as it possibly can be? Absolutely, because the supervision is absolutely absolutely world class. They're being very carefully selected, very carefully supervised. And when we say safe in the normal English use of the word, yeah, it probably is safe. But it's just one of those things that annoys me. When you get non-healthcare professionals saying, is it safe? Well, no treatment's safe. Taking an aspirin is not safe. There's never any guarantees. It's overwhelmingly likely to be fine in most people most of the time. But um, there is an element of risk. That, that's, that's true. So they're going to test the efficacy of the vaccine, second generation vaccines. Now, of course, we're going to need um, more specific vaccines that are more specific to the new variants sooner rather than later. And we really can't do another 30, 40,000 person clinical trial because apart from anything else, who would we use in the, in the, uh, in the control group? All we could do was compare it, the efficacy with uh, the new vaccine with the old vaccine, but then we'd have to have a particular strain. It would get really complicated now because kind of the virgin territory that the vaccine researchers were using last year, where, where people had not been exposed to the virus or, or, or exposed to a vaccine, that's no longer there. So it's now much more complicated than it was. So this does seem to be the way ahead. Uh, they're going to test all the immunological reactions, all the immunogenicity, lots of tests. Transmission characteristics, uh, viral infective dose, all of these things can be can be hallucinated from this. Now, it's going to be administered in, in liquid form uh, into the volunteers' nostrils. And the clinical facility is at the, uh, the Royal Free Hospital in London. 
Now, I, I actually forget where they're getting their um, virus from, but the, there's, a, there's a hospital medical group in the UK is basically brewing up this virus, I guess in cell cultures, and uh, they're able to precisely specify the dose and the form of the virus that they're giving. So very, very uh, tightly controlled and can yield an awful lot of information awfully quickly. And to be quite honest, this is information that the world needs. The, the, the young people concerned are going to be isolated in a room for two and a half weeks. Uh, and then they're going to be monitored for up to a year. Uh, so um, very noble of, of these people to do that. Now, there's way more volunteers than places at the moment. So there's quite a lot of people want to do it. Um, officially, the volunteers are not paid. Uh, but between you and me, they get four and a half thousand pounds for their expenses. So um, that, 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 that seems to be the deal. But still, it's it's um, it's it's an, it's well controlled. It'll be interesting, but it's still it's still a noble thing to do. So that they have my admiration, and the amount of information we'll get really quickly is really quite significant. This is this is going to be a, a leap forward in knowledge and understanding, and the ability to test out new vaccines, second generation vaccines, new formulations of vaccines. Knowledge will increase rapidly as a result of this. Now, um, some good news from the from the UK. Risk of outdoor transmission for COVID-19 is low. Now, last year we were worried about uh, outdoor activities. So there was crowded beaches. There's a lot of demonstrations going on outside. Now, the demonstrations are probably a bit difficult because uh, different because people are shouting and releasing a lot of virus. But this, this work, uh, th this report from the Scientific Advisory Group for Emergencies is basically saying beaches seem to be pretty safe. So um, this is um, Professor Mark Woodhouse, infectious disease epidemiologist, University of Edinburgh, member of SAGE. Uh, he's made a report. There's been very, very little evidence that any transmission outdoors has happened in the UK. Diluting the viral load. It's what we've said all the way along. And when you're indoors, you need to dilute the viral load with ventilation. So good, good to get the experts uh, collaborating what we've been saying for months. Uh, there were no outbreaks linked to crowded beaches. So that was good. Uh, avoid pinch points, he does say, uh, like travel on public transport. <coughs> Caffs. Public toilets could be an issue as well. So it's not the beaches themselves, it's partly the, the infrastructure that goes around that. So are people congregating somewhere for a drink, congregating somewhere for a sandwich, for a hamburger, or an egg sandwich or whatever it is. And, and are they congregating in toilets would be the other one. So there are risks. But outdoor, viral load is sufficiently diluted. Now having said that, this work is based on the old variant, not so much the new variant. But he was bold enough to say it, he's a member of SAGE, so that makes it worth reporting, I think. So it means that pretty soon uh, outdoor activities um, should be permissible again. But with the, with the problem with public transport, though, of course, that means people who have cars can go to beaches and other people can't. So there, there is a, an issue still to be addressed there. Um, but it's looking like outdoor transmission is not a big risk factor, as we have thought really for the last, well, for about a year now. Now, 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 moving on to, I'm going to get, some interesting reports from the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. Now, this is the institute based in Washington State. It's, it's, uh, I, th I think most of the facilities are in Seattle. And, and they're pretty impressive global uh, prognosticators. Uh, but just before we get on to that, um, this is the number of uh, cases going down in the United States. And we looked at this yesterday. And we decided we weren't entirely sure why it was going down. Yes, it was largely behavioural, probably a bit of herd immunity. Lots of people have had the infection, but not as many as would generate proper herd immunity. Certainly not enough vaccinated to generate herd immunity yet. Seasonality in the virus, all these things. Still concerned about the new variant, though. But we weren't sure, basically. But interestingly, that's the number of new cases. And that is the number of uh, tests done in the United States. So... Part of this reduction, actually, is, we can't say how much, but part of this reduction is artifactual because less tests are being done. 
So is there a genuine reduction in the states? Absolutely there is because hospitalizations are way down. We know that's true. But the actual reduction in the case numbers might be partly artifactual as well as those other factors we've considered and more we're about to consider. And as well as that, people have many, many emails from the states have told me that the number of cycles they're using in the PCR tests has gone down. Therefore, they're reducing the number of false positives that they now get. Now, I can't find a reference for that. So if you've got one, if you live in the States, do send me that and I'll report on it. But many people have said that the tests have now, so the, 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 the cycles are like toned down the sensitivity of the test. So they're getting less false positive results. And that's part of the reason the numbers are coming down. It's more than that because the hospitalizations are coming down. So there is a genuine phenomena here. But I just thought that was kind of interesting. We always have to look at the number of tests. And while I was there, uh, our world in data, I just downloaded this as well. This is the world uh, record. And again, the number of cases globally do seem to be coming down. So we've considered India from time to time, for example, where the numbers of cases appear to have absolutely plummeted. So this is encouraging. Uh, we're still concerned about the new variants. I just wish we understood why this is happening. Um, because um, if, if it's going down for some arbitrary reason, would it go up for some arbitrary reason as well that we don't know of? Um, just shows that there's so many things we actually don't know um, about this virus and this pandemic. Anyway, get, getting on to uh, more specific information, check it out for yourself, Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation. Report from the uh, 12th of February, so it's a few days ago now, but still, still up to date. Um, US cases have declined sharply. Next four months, balance of four factors are going to determine what's going to happen. And they do stress that many different outcomes are still possible. So they are certainly not saying what will happen. They're actually saying there's too many variables to work out what will happen. And this could stay the same, get better or get worse, I guess is what they're, they're really saying. Um, uh, vaccinations uh, in, the, in the States at the moment, 71 prepared to accept the vaccine. I'm not too worried about this now. That will go up, I'm sure. Um, declining seasonality until now. Um, declining season, seasonality between now and next August. So that was the first point. The vaccination is one point, how that's going to go. The second point they're making is the seasonality. Now, they're saying, although it's still winter in the States, they're actually saying that there'll be seasonal factors that will reduce the transmission of the virus between now, February, all the way through to August. I, I wouldn't have thought the seasonal factor would kick into about April or something like that, but that, that's, that's what they're saying. And uh, yeah, that's what they're saying. Uh, but the third factor, of course, is the spread of the variant. B B117 is the main one, the UK variant. And people's behaviour is the fourth factor. So these four factors... And the interaction of these four factors are going to determine what's going to happen to the pandemic in the next few months as we move forward into spring and early summer. And they are saying they don't have enough data to compute the outcome. But it's going to be an interaction of those factors. So uh, that one's good. That one's good. Uh, that one's bad. That one's potentially bad if the behaviour is bad. So those two are decreasing cases, those two are increasing cases. Right, um, daily, case, day, daily case decline, vaccinations increase. So what this is saying is what they are, what the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation are saying is it's well publicised now that there's more and more vaccines getting out. It's well publicised now that the number of cases are going down. Therefore, people think the pandemic's over. Therefore, they won't behave in ways that limit transmission of the virus as much. So this attitudinal factor is a big risk. And of course, we stress this is by no means over yet. The numbers of cases are coming down. Yes, but they're coming down from a high level. Hospitals are going to be severely stretched in the UK for the next six weeks. And I suspect that's the same in most places or many places in the States as well. So we don't want behaviours to increase transmission. We've got to still have behaviours that reduce transmission despite declining cases, despite vaccines, which we're very grateful for. But it's too early to change behaviour. Infections are expected to increase after mid-March for at least four to six weeks. 
Right. So that they're, they're admitting that the cases are going down. Um, here we see the number of cases. And what they're saying is for four to six weeks from mid-March, they'll start going up again. Now, they don't know how much, of course. They don't know how much they'll go up because it's going to be an interaction of these four factors that they don't fully understand. But they are going to predict that from mid-March, cases will go up until what? Uh, mid-March till the end of April. Well, they've been right before. So another reason to certainly not have any complacency. Uh, so cases are going to decline until mid-March, then increase to over 200,000 a day by early April. Right, so what they're saying is, and they're fairly clear in this prediction, they're saying that these cases are going to keep going down until mid-March. So they'll keep going down for another four weeks. Then they'll go up for four or six weeks after that. So if this prediction is correct, cases in the States will carry on going down for four weeks. Then they'll go up for five, four four, five or six weeks, and then they'll hopefully crash down with summer and vaccination. Um, that's what they are predicting. In the UK, I'm expecting the cases to keep going down as long as we keep these lockdown measures in place to get the cases well down first as the vaccines start to take an effect. Stress on hospital capacity in some states. Uh, Deaths not increasing due to vaccination. Right, okay. So this is good news. So, so what they're saying here is that, yes, uh, in a few weeks' time, cases will start going up again. But they don't expect that. So the death rate is high in the States now. It's falling down very slowly. But what they're saying is they don't expect, although cases will go up again from mid-March till the end of April, the case, the case numbers will go up, but the number of deaths won't. Because so many people are going to the high risk groups are now protected by vaccination. And we know that vaccines are much more effective in preventing death than they are at preventing spread. We believe they're quite good at effect in uh, preventing spread in the 60, 60 to 70 percent range. 67 percent was about the last figure I had. But, but uh, they're much more effective, about near, almost 100 percent effective at preventing deaths in people that have been vaccinated. So cases will go up. But it's going to be less of a problem because there's going to be less hospitalizations and less deaths because of the preventative effect of the vaccine. And they estimate it's going to be, the vaccines are going to prevent 114,000 deaths. But they do say that the deaths by the 1st of June will reach over 600,000. So there's still, unfortunately, quite a few people are still going to die from this pandemic. But the number is flexible depending on the interaction of um, the interaction of these these four factors that we've looked at. So um, I guess it's nice to have a choice. So daily deaths will continue to decline. Mask wearing at the moment, 76% of people always wore a mask when leaving the home. Universal mask wearing would mean 34,000 fewer cumulative deaths by the 1st of June. I mean, when they actually put numbers on this, that by more people wearing masks, 34,000 less people would die. That really brings it home, doesn't it? The importance of this. Uh, unknown protection of previous infections. Now, th th they're, they're worried about the South Africa variant. That They're saying that if people have been previously exposed to the virus, they currently don't have the data to work out how likely they are to be reinfected with the South Africa variant. And we've looked at that over the past few days. I think the answer is pretty unlikely, but there will be a number of them. And I think we can say with some degree of safety that there'll be more reinfections as a result of the South Africa variant than if we hadn't had the South Africa variant. But I still expect the overall number to be low and expect the amount of morbidity and mortality that the new variant will cause to carry on going down because of the protective effects of the vaccines against hospitalizations and deaths. Uh, current situation, 80% of people in the US have been infected as of uh, February the 8th, according to their data, 59 million people. I would have thought it's higher. I would have thought it's quite a bit higher, but they've got a lot of data. This is what they're saying. Cumulative infection rates uh, are greater in 25% North Dakota, Nebraska, Iowa and New York. And of course, we've kind of followed the outbreaks in these areas that have given rise to this high level of infection. 
Okay, so some interesting prognostications there. Um, and uh, all I can say is the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation have been right on various occasions, most occasions in the past. So we do have to warn, heed, heed their warnings quite seriously. Now, Johnson & Johnson, uh, first... Uh, First vaccine has been first used in anger in South Africa. This is the Janssen vaccine. Um, now, the, tragically, the South African government have made the mistake of not using a million doses of Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, which could have prevented lots of hospitalizations and deaths. They are their thinking on this is just bizarre to me. Why on earth did they not use the vaccines they have for the population of the country they have? They could have prevented uh, severe uh, severe illness and death. It is just inexplicable that the South African government um, have done what is completely inconsistent with my thinking and indeed with the actions of governments around the world. So South Africa really out on a limb there and I think they've got it wrong. Uh, but they've had the first batch of 80,000. So they've got a million vaccines sitting on the shelf. And hey ho, they've had 80,000 vaccines landed from Brussels for the Johnson & Johnson like less than less than a tenth the amount um what are they playing at? i don't know anyway the the the, the janssen uh, vaccine is very good because it's a single dose stored in refrigerators brilliant but they're going to need enough for everyone uh one dose of course the the johnson and johnson vaccine is one dose <clears throat> which is good but um it just grieves me to think of those oxford astrazeneca vaccines sitting there on the shelf in south africa doing nothing i could have one Many of you watching could have one. Now, just a little more on the Johnson Johnson vaccine while I'm here. Um, it's going to be approved by the FDA in the next few weeks. In the next month, it's going to be FDA approved. No question about that at all. Wish they get on with it. But they only have a few million doses in stock. Now, this is being worked on, but they are committed to produce 100 million doses by June. But most of those won't be arriving till June. So the supplies of vaccine are an issue. Pfizer and Moderna vaccine, uh, 200 million doses altogether promised to the United States by the end of March. Only 72 million doses have been shipped so far. So um, the vaccine supply continues um, to be the main issue, vaccine supply and internal logistics. Now, moving on to the European Union, um, who have been massively embarrassed by their... Um, failure to deliver vaccines to their population anything like as quick as the united kingdom or the united states or other is or israel united arab emirates um it's, it's been a pretty disastrous actually to be quite honest um but they've started this i don't know what it stands for yet we will check it out h-e-i-r-a incubator program now this is the european union being proactive which is good they've learned from their mistakes uh, in the second generation vaccine development. So they realise now, thankfully, ahead of time, that we're going to need second generation vaccines that are more specific to the new variations. So that is good. So having failed to be proactive throughout most of 2020, I'm delighted to see they are being proactive in uh, 2021. Good news. Let's hope this really takes off. Actually, I've got this down as Ursula von der Leyen, but it was actually one of her one of her lackeys that said this, one of her statement people. The virus has evolved and will continue to evolve, obviously. Uh, it's important we prepare for mutations, obviously, but this time they actually have done. So already authorised AstraZeneca, Pfizer, BioNTech and Moderna vaccines in Europe and uh, Johnson & Johnson, European Medicines Agency, by the middle of March. Uh, they really need to get on with this. And uh, indeed, as uh, yeah, they need to get on with this. Now, um, Croatia, another European Union country, has broken ranks. They're so fed up with having to wait for the vaccine. So Croatia's in talks with one to two, for one to two million doses of Sputnik vaccine from uh, the Russians. Not yet approved by the European Medicines Agency. Hungary is currently using Sputnik V. And of course, for Croatia, this is absolutely vital because they're absolutely broke because there's been no tourism. So another European country... Um, kind of voting with its feet there really on vaccine procurement uh, from alternative sources other than the 
grandiose Central European system, which has failed. And of course, Germany ordered an extra 30 million doses of Pfizer vaccine independently of the European Union as well. Um, now, it didn't have to be this way. Bear in mind, when, when, the, um, when, when the UK went its own way back in, uh, back in late 2020, we were still governed by European legislation then. We were still governed by all the European laws. So um, there's no reason why independent mem member states could not go their own way as the UK did. And the people are suffering as a result of this. And this is what, this is what really annoys me, that there's people dying now uh, unnecessarily all over Europe. Um, I really don't care less about the, the politics. It, it's, it's how people are, are suffering and um, many have been failed. So that's the problem. Now, South Africa, uh, Adrian Gore, CEO of Health Insurer Discovery. Now, I believe this is one of the bigger health insurance groups in South Africa. I'm not sure. Anyway, he says there's the number of people who have been infected in our view is currently probably over 50 percent of the country. Interesting. So probably more people have been infected in South Africa than anywhere else that we've got data for. Uh, there's quite a few countries where we don't have data that's complete Iran Russia China uh, we don't have complete data but um, South Africa they reckon over 50% have been exposed uh, most of the excess deaths in South Africa and there's been a lot of attributable to COVID-19 National Blood Transfusion Service Eastern Cape Eastern Cape has been a bit of a disaster uh, we've looked at uh, hospitals in Port Elizabeth for example where there's been a, a unnecessary deaths due to um, mismanagement and uh, local problems in Eastern Cape, but they reckon 63% have been infected. Uh, Kwazulu, uh, KwaZulu Natal, they reckon 52%. So Eastern Cape uh, leading the way. Western, Western Cape, uh, which is is uh, has got more more uh, efficient um, governance, uh, less affected. Eastern Cape, 63%, quite a big number uh, getting towards some herd immunity effects. Uh, pity about the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. And let, let, let's hope these uh, pitifully few doses of Johnson & Johnson Janssen vaccine are well used. Now, uh, let's talk. No, let's, we'll, we'll, we'll do one more thing before we talk to Nick. Taiwan. Um Taiwan, of course, proactive model of how to prevent the pandemic. Virtually no community transmission since, oh, I don't know, February, March 2020. Uh, exemplary performance throughout the pandemic, protected its citizens superbly. And of course, now it wants vaccines. So the health minister in Taiwan... He said the critical deal to require the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine has failed at the final step. I was worried about interference from external forces. Really? So Taiwan worried about external forces. OK. Uh, I, I was worried about political pressure. I see. Political pressure. We believe there was political pressure. The deal fell through because someone doesn't want Taiwan to be happy. Uh, who could that be? Now, we know about these problems already, but the German firm BioNTech struck a deal with Shanghai-based pharmaceutical group to bring the vaccine to China. So Pfizer BioNTech, BioNTech, I don't know, I don't actually, I'm not sure, I don't think this is Pfizer, I think this is Bio, BioNTech specifically. BioNTech, um, it looks like they've authorised vaccines to China and uh, are refusing to supply vaccines to Taiwan. Uh, if that is the case, BioNTech, not your finest hour. Not your finest hour at all. If I'm wrong, get in touch with me, BioNTech. It doesn't look good. Not impressed. Right, let us, let us talk to... Nick. I think we can talk to Nick. Now, um, of course, we, li we like to uh, understand the individual experience on this channel as well as the collective experience. Hi. 
So uh, I thought I'd come back just with a couple of little updates. Uh, first update is in go. regards to my vaccine. Um, by day three, it really did get quite painful at the vaccine site, up to about six out of ten, I'd say. Um, in that, every time I rolled on it at night for about three nights, it would wake me up, um, which was quite irritating. It then developed an irritating itch at the vaccination site. Um, but then by day seven, that's all completely gone. Um, so that's great. Um, and the second update is in regards to uh, Dr. John's video um, about uh, post-vaccination death um, and my personal experiences with that. Um, my granddad was vaccinated on the 30th of December with the Pfizer jab. Um, he then had a stroke five to six days later. I was admitted to hospital. Um, f five days later than that, he tested positive for COVID. Um, and then by on the 1st of February, um, unfortunately, he passed away. Now I can leave you there um, with those anti-vax tabloid grabbing headlines. Um, but I, we, we said Dr. John's channel, we couldn't do that. We have to give you the facts. And so we will dig a little deeper. And I will tell you that he was a 97 year old man that was, whose health was failing drastically and, and fast within the last six months. Um, and two to three weeks prior to him having his um, COVID jab, he had a TIA, a transient ischemic attack, which was known as a mini stroke. Um, one in three people will go on to develop a stroke after a TIA. And I imagine that that proportion is higher um, amongst people who are 97 years old. Now, he had his vaccination. Um, we were really happy about that. Um, we were meant, we, were, well, we hoped it he wouldn't become a COVID statistic. Um, and unfortunately, as, we, as I said, five days after that, he had a, what was query a stroke UTI, it turned out to be a stroke. Um, about five days into his hospital admittance for that, he spiked a fever and there had been an outbreak on the ward um, and he tested positive, unfortunately, for COVID. Um, now, whether he caught the COVID there at that ward or whether he caught the COVID at the vaccination centre, we, we won't know, really. Um, the vaccination centre was a bit of a shambles at the, at the beginning. Um, it's the 30th, so right at the very beginning. Um, I said it was December um, 2020, so right at the very beginning of the rollout. Um, all the computers were down and it was stacked full of old people. Um, yeah, it wasn't great. It was a super spreader event. Um, but we're not here to dwell on that. You know, things things get learned and they move on. Um, so he had his jab, he developed his, he had a, had a stroke um, and developed COVID and spiked fever. And that was about all he did. Um, it didn't really affect him much more than that. So we were hoping to, within 14 days of him giving his positive um, result, um, to give a negative and to be released out so he could essentially recover or or die at home um, in his own comfort and surroundings that he knew and loved with people around him that he knew and loved um, and he was quite agitated about getting out of hospital for that to happen um, but unfortunately by that point in time whether it was the covid or his stroke his mental ability had gone had declined drastically and he was unfortunately wasn't really aware where he was anymore um, so by the time he was clear, he was able to get, we were able to get his children, his two sons and his daughter to his bedside. And he was aware that he, they were there. But unfortunately, on the 1st of February, he passed um, after being given a um, morphine driver because um, he was in palliative care. So that's um, one of the good things we can do. Um, um, someone who is in respiratory failure with a pulmonary embolism from COVID, um, if given morphine is you know quite likely to pass away um at that point and sure enough he did and that's it meant he passed in no pain um and um no suffering really which is great um so yeah you know it means there are going to be people who are these statistics unfortunately my uncle, my granddad one of them um and you know 
they're, they're going to be f- not full of them in the newspapers, but you're going to read about them. You, people are going to tell you about them. You're going to read about them on Facebook, on Twitter, and they're going to annoy you. They're going to be disrespectful to your your family's memory um, and your friends and anyone else around you who has been affected by this. Um, but you've just got to dig deeper and know that probably 99% of those people who have died after having a vaccine have died from other reasons and not to do with the vaccine 99.999 percent um um, so yeah i'm gonna leave it there um thank you so much um i'll be back in 12 weeks to let you know about my second dose um of the covid astrazeneca jab um until then everyone stay safe and well and good luck thank you hi Uh, i thought i'd come back with a couple of little updates uh first update is in regards to my turn nick off um by day three, it really did get quite painful at the vaccine site, up to about six out of ten. Yeah, the say. technology. Uh, there we go. Nick, um, thank you for that. Uh, and, of course, um, condolences on, on, on your loss. Uh, death is never an easy thing. Um, you, you raised several really important points there, so I'm just going to sort of mention them briefly. Um, when someone has first had the vaccine they have no more immunity against COVID for two or three weeks, up to four weeks, than anyone else. So deaths from COVID can still occur in the week or two after vaccination. I think that's important to realise. So Grandad had had a history of transient ischemic attacks. That's not enough blood supply to the brain. And one of those lasted for longer, became a stroke. He also had COVID and you say he had a, a blood clot in the lung, a pulmonary embolism as a result of the COVID. So um, it seems clear that um, he, he died, as you rightly say, having the vaccine was not the thing that, that caused his death, but he was in a very high risk category. And having the stroke, again, was it the COVID? Did he die with the COVID from the COVID? You could argue about that. Um, now, you did mention that your dad, uh, granddad was suffering, so he was given morphine. Now, um, Again, this, this is a separate separate topic, but um, I've given morphine many, many times to people that are dying and, and very often it's, it, it, well, it is, it's a wonderful drug. And uh, giving morphine to people in that situation, as long as it's indicated to treat pain and suffering is the right thing to do. It becomes the wrong thing to do if there is not pain and suffering there. But, but in this case, clearly there was. So I'm happy it's the right thing to do. And the other thing uh, I want, just want to say to Nick there is really, uh, bless him, um, <laughs> I told him I told him to keep this report down to five minutes and uh, he wasn't far off. So um, appreciate that. And, uh, and I'm sure many of you will. Um, will uh, well, many of us can, can relate to Nick, of course, and uh, th- important things to learn there for for the understanding of the pandemic. And uh, remember, vaccination is our way out of this. So thanks for that, Nick. And thank you to you for watching.